That's where we're going. But Revelation 9 first. I just don't have it on the screen. I know that messes with you, and I'm sorry, but... Revelation 9. Revelation 9, everybody. Revelation 9. You know, let me start out with this. We're, we're talking about a beast rising up out of the bottomless pit in Revelation 9, um, 11. And uh, there's still a, a few more things I'm going to go through on this idea of the destroyer. But we know in Revelation 13, let me read that to you real quick. I uh, stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And uh, I, when I think of that, I think of that story of David when he was a shepherd uh, tending to his father's sheep. And a lion and a bear, both, he says, both of them. I don't think it was at the same time. I think it's two different events. But this lion came out and grabbed a lamb out of the flock and run off with it and had it in its mouth. And David ran and chased the lion down, grabbed the lion by the beard under his chin, and the Bible says he smote the lion. He pulled the lamb out, and then he killed the lion. That's tough. That's, that's mean, amen. Huh? Oh, that's, uh, oh man, you had to ask me. That is uh, Revelation, oh no, uh, 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17. That's the story of Goliath. And David presents himself to Saul saying, King Saul, I can go out and kill Goliath. And Saul's looking at him. He's a little guy, a little redhead. And the Bible says he was ruddy, which means he's redheaded. He looked like Opie. So think of Opie from Andy Griffith's show from Mayberry showing up. Paul said, I can kill that, that giant for you. And everybody's laughing at his brothers are telling him, go back home, you little brat. And uh, David said, uh, he's defying the armies of the living God. And he's blaspheming God. Now he says, I'm just not going to, can't, I can't live with that. I'm not going to allow it to happen. And of course, Saul says, well, at least take my armor. And David says, I've never wore your armor before. I don't trust it. Probably wouldn't fit anyway. So he picked up one thing David was good at. Was slinging rocks. And uh, of course, we believe God helped him. But he tells the story to King Saul. He said how both a lion and a bear uh, came into his, to the sheep and he smote them both. And he kept, captured the lamb out of the jaw, the mouth of the lion. And uh, he said, thy servant, meaning me, David, slew both the lion and a bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine is as them. And I'm going to slay him too. And he did. Laid him out killed him. Killed him with his own sword. Amen. I like that. But anyway, uh, in Revelation 13, the Bible says, after it says his mouth is as the mouth of a lion, the Bible says the dragon, the dragon, gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And um, so years ago, I, I did a study. Of course, we know from Revelation 12 uh, who this dragon is. Uh, we know that it is the devil, Satan, uh, the serpent. We also know from uh, oh Revelation, oh, I can't remember where it is, later on, that, the, the, oh, yeah, Revelation um, 20 tells him how he threw the dragon, who is the, uh, who is the devil and Satan, so... Two places that identifies the dragon as the devil. 
And uh, we have the devil giving the, the beast, the Antichrist, his power, his seat, and great authority. So uh, several years ago, I, I just I said, I want to know what the Bible says about dragons. And uh, I did a study on it. And, uh, and I'm going to do another one. I'm going to re retool that study. And was that Sam's Friday with Sweetie Pie? And of course, there was a game that came out uh, in the 70s, and I knew some guys that were playing it, and it was called Dungeons and Dragons. And it's fantasy role playing. Back then, uh, back, this is before computer games, uh, you had a board and you had this dice that you threw, and it determined different things. I never played the game, but I knew some guys that did. And. Um, I'll just tell you a quick little story. And I, uh, there was a while I was in Oklahoma, there was a there was a young man just a couple years younger than me. His name was uh, Sean Sellers, and he was very very deep into Dungeons and Dragons. And I mean, he was really deep into it, and uh, for no reason at all. One night he killed his mother, his stepfather. And then left the house, went down, and, and I guess stopped at a quick stop, a convenience store, 7-Eleven or something like that, and c killed the convenience store clerk. Cold blood. And they tried him as, a, he was like 16 years old, they tried him as an adult. And by the time he was tried and convicted, he was sentenced to death, and he was the youngest person ever put on death row, in modern times at least. And he's 17 years old and he's on death row. Well, while he's in prison, I guess a minister starts or somebody, people writing him or whatever, or somebody in prison talked to him. But anyway, he ends up giving his life over to the Lord. He realizes and he starts telling that he said, I had, I was possessed. Now he wasn't given an excuse. He was not trying to get out of his sentence. He said, I deserve to die for what I did. But he, he told, they let him do an interview on television. And he said, I think Geraldo did it. He said, don't get into this stuff. He said, it takes, it takes you over. Because basically you're playing the, the role of a wizard a dragon or you gain powers I'm gonna preach on powers this morning you gain powers at the roll of the dice or however the game plays I don't know but you get power but now they put it of course you know at the advent of computers they quickly moved it over to a computer based game then then they started coming out with computer graphics and now they're playing playing Dungeons and Dragon type games all over the place and there's a movie out now. So I'm at Sam's and I've already picked up this book. And I hear these two ladies, not kids, ladies. And they're looking at this book and they're saying, um, one lady said, have you seen the movie? And this other lady said, no, we haven't. And these you know, ladies are probably in their 30s, 40s, got kids. And the one lady said, oh, it was good. I mean, it was really good. You got to go see this. We're, talking about, we're not talking about kid stuff. We're talking about grown adults who grew up in a, and I would say a non-Bible household, a non-Christian community, non-Christian America. Grew up under that. And I can show you Isaiah 13, Isaiah 34, that any time you have the absence of Jesus Christ, you will have dragons. Here's the thing. If the dragon represents Satan, the lamb is Christ and the lamb is king. You cannot have Jesus and the dragon living in the same place at the same time. They don't get along. Amen. When, when, the, when the devil showed up to Jesus in uh, Luke chapter 4, I think Matthew chapter 4. But anyway, when the devil showed up to Jesus to tempt him in the wilderness and Jesus wasn't buying it, 
and he didn't fall for the temptation, the Bible says the devil left him. Paul tells us, resist the devil and he will flee from you. All you got to do is stand against him and say, get out of here. And in Jesus' name, and he'll leave because he cannot stand the presence of Jesus Christ. Here is the presence to us here in this church and in our daily lives. This is the presence of Jesus Christ right here. This is his word. This is him. This is what he said. This is who he was on every page, every line. It is the word of God. Here, so here's enough. So this is popular now. This is making, going to make billions of dollars. You've got the movie sales. And uh, by the way, the Jim Caviezel movie where he plays the role of a guy that goes and rescues kids from sex trafficking is beating this movie, which I'm glad to hear. But anyway, you got that. And then this was being sold. This is a graphic novel, what, they, what we used to call comic books. Okay? They don't call them comic books anymore. They're graphic novels, graphic books or whatever. And it's about wings of fire. And it's about a, a dragon called Moon. Okay? Well, in Genesis 1, God created two lights. The greater light to rule over the day. Who's that? It's Christ. The lesser light to rule over the night, the darkness. Okay? So this dragon's called Moon. I, I, don't, I haven't read it. I haven't, I haven't got into it yet. I just bought it. Um, but anyway, guess who, guess who made this book? Guess who prints this book and sells it? You remember being in school? I guess, I don't know when they started doing this, but they did it all. I couldn't wait for the day that we got the little Scholastic Books catalog. And I'd come running home to sc from school and going, Mom, I want this book. In fact, Mom, there's three books on here I want. And Mom's going, uh-uh, you ain't getting three. You might get one. But I ain't buying three. These are expensive. But anyway, Scholastic put out, puts out books, sells them to children in schools. This is their publication. It's a Scholastic book. And it is full of dragons are good. Dragons are great. Dragons are wonderful. Dragons are heroes. Okay? And you got movies, and I won't get into all that. But that's just, that's what's out right now. And it ain't just kids buying into it. It's adults too. Okay? So we have an entire generation, more than one generation, in this country that is being directly, they, if, if I say this, it's going to sound like I'm crazy, but directly affected by, I didn't say controlled by, I didn't say possessed by, I said affected by Satan himself. This is his, this is his teaching, this is his doctrine, this is the way he brings things forth to people. And to bring this out in an earlier time would have gone nowhere in a, in a much more Christianized America. But America hasn't been Christianized in a long time. So as the Bible goes out, the dragons move in. Okay? New video. I haven't even started it yet, but I saw the books and I'm going, yep, I'm going to have to work on that. But remember... This beast here in Revelation 9, the dragon, when he rises up out of the pit, it's the dragon that gives him his power, his power, his seat, which is his throne, and great authority. Meaning that this beast is going to rule over practically everybody. All right. Now, uh, we noted in verse 11 that the name of this beast is the is the king. Oh, by the way, I got something else for you. I didn't, I didn't buy this book. I probably should have. But um, 
This was written by Rick Riordan. He's the guy that wrote the Percy Jackson series. And they've made a couple movies out of that too. These are all written for adolescent boys and girls. And he's written, he's got a new series going called The Sun and the Star. And um, the, the main character in this set of books is uh, a demigod. And let me explain what a demigod is. It's a half God and a half human. Okay, how does that happen? Read Genesis 6. Okay, but anyway, the name of this character who is a half God and half human is Nico or Nico D'Angelo. Now, let me tell you what that name means. Nico is where we get the name Nicodemus. It's where we get the word Nicolaitan. And Nico, for the, uh, the name Nicholas, mean, or uh, Nicole, it means to conquer. And it means a king. That's what it means. It's a Greek word. And it means a king because it means to conquer. So the, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans that Jesus said he hated was where the clergy ruled over the people in the pews, the laity. And he said, I hate both the deeds and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Well, you have that now in a lot of churches where the priest or pastor will be the one who has all the power. He's got all the word of God. You have nothing and you will get nothing if you don't get it from him. That's the doctrine and the deeds of the Nicolaitans. So, Nico means a king or a queen in the case of the word Nicole. And I haven't figured out if this character is a boy or a girl. But anyway, D'Angelo, guess what that means? The angel. Okay? So, the name Nico D'Angelo would mean what? King of the angels. Now look at Revelation 9-11. And they had a king over them. Which is the angel of the bottomless pit. Whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. But in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. You get it? King of the angels. Okay. And kids are reading. Kids are eating this up. They won't, can't, they won't touch a Bible. They can't read a Bible. Some households, parents don't want their kids reading a Bible. So they read Satan's books. Because that's exactly what they are. All right, now I'm going to move on. Since this angel is called Abaddon and Apollyon, which means the destroyer, Apollo, the, the, the sun god, was a god of prophecy. Apollo means destroyer. Uh, Shiva, the Hindu god, is the destroyer. Shiva, the destroyer. So he has different names in different religions. Apollo for the Greeks. Shiva for the Hindus. Uh, Abaddon for those who speak Hebrew. But his name is the destroyer. Job 15, 20, the wicked man travaileth with pain all his days and the number of his years is hidden of the, I think I probably read this last Sunday, but anyway, a dreadful sound is in his years in prosperity, the destroyer shall come upon him. Psalm 17, let my sentence come forth from thy presence. Let thine eyes behold the things that are equal. Thou hast proved mine heart. Thou hast visited me in the night. And this is, this is where it comes down to who has the right to judge you. God does. And when God proves your heart, he's going to show you what's wrong with you and what's right with you. But he's going to be equal about it. He's going to be right about it. And he says, uh, I am purpose that my mouth shall not transgress. Verse four, concerning the works of men, by the word of thy lips, I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. Um, yeah, I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. It means I have lived my life with God's help in such a way is that when this destroyer comes, I don't have to worry about him. God has put me on a path that is different than the one the destroyer is on. 
uh, in Ephesians 2.2, 2, that you'll find that path. And it's called the course of this world. Uh, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. That's the path of the destroyer. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So that's what I mean. You don't have to be a black robe, goat head wearing Satanist to be influenced by his spirit. You don't have to draw pentagrams and have uh, pentagram tattoos. You don't have to carve pentagrams into your skin. You don't have to tell everybody you're a witch. You don't have to do anything like that. In fact, you don't even have to believe that Satan is real. In fact, he would rather you not believe he's real. Because that's where his power comes from. Satan doesn't exist. It's just what people does. Well, if that's the case, then are we just animals? Animals do what animals just do. Okay? Nobody... Well, I would, say, I would say nobody. But dogs don't sue other dogs for paternity. Right? They don't go... One dog doesn't look at another male dog and say, uh, that's my girl. Okay? Because the female dog, she don't care. And that's what animals do. But God made us higher than them. Made us with the ability to know what's right and what's wrong. And we're supposed to do what's right. You do what's wrong, then it's obvious that you're being led and you're following what a spirit inside of you is guiding you to do. And that spirit is the prince of the power of the air. And you're following the path of the destroyer. Verse 5, hold my goings in thy paths that my footsteps slip not. I have called upon thee, for thou wilt hear me, O God, incline thine ear unto me, and hear my speech. You want God to hear your prayers. Get out of the path of the destroyer. Amen? Get out of his way. Verse Jeremiah 4. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground. I, was, I got a chance to witness my neighbor again yesterday. Oh, that's, that's from the book. I've, I've, actually, I forgot I put it in my notes. Demigods Nico D'Angelo and Will Solis must endure the terrors of Tartarus. Who knows what Tartarus is? It's a sauce you dip fish in. <laughs> Gloria laughed at that. I made my mother-in-law laugh. She hasn't laughed at me since our wedding. Anyway, Tartarus is hell. Uh, must endure the terrors of Tartarus in their attempt to rescue an old friend in this thrilling adventure co-written by best-selling author Rick Riordan and award-winning author Mark Oshiro. Anyway, Jeremiah 4, break up the fallow ground. I was witnessing to my neighbor yesterday. He come home and he just came over. He saw me uh, pulling weeds and pulling them old thistles out of my flower garden. And then I bought me a, a handheld electric tiller i love this thing because i started pulling stuff at the beginning of the growing season this year and, and realized that that ground and that flower bed was solid rock it was hard as rock and so over the course of the summer i get that electric tiller out and i've been tilling that ground and keeping it loose and so now when I see one of them things pop up, I just reach over and just put, it comes right out root and all. Because that ground is, is soft. That ground was fallow. That means it's, it's like, and I told my neighbor, I said, it's like a guy buying a field that hadn't been farmed in years. And the first thing he's got to do in Missouri is cut down all the cedars out of it. And then he's got to break up and he's got to till that ground or he can't grow anything that he wants to grow in there. And I said, isn't that something? That the thing, I said, think about life. And, he's, and I said, the things that we don't want in our life, they show up automatically. I said, these, I've been pulling these thistles out of this thing for more than 20 years. And I said, they keep growing, keep growing. I don't know, how, I don't know where they keep coming from, but they just keep growing. And I keep pulling them out. I said, but the things I want in here, these pretty flowers, I have to 
plant them and I have to take care of them and then I have to come out here and make sure that the thistles and the Johnson grass and everything else doesn't overgrow them and kill them. And when I started, to, I said, that's our life. And I said, this is all out of the Bible. As soon as I said the Bible, now I don't think he did this deliberately, but they had just pulled in, him and his wife, and he said, shook hands with me. He said, I got to go help my wife take in groceries. I said, I know what that's all about. But that was, the end of, that was the end of the conversation with him. So you pray for him. But to break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Thorns in the Bible represent sin. In the parable that Jesus taught, the parable of the seed and the sower, he gives four classifications of people where the word of God has gone to them. The first group is the, the sower sows seeds and some falls by the wayside. This is back in the days when guys went out with a bag of seeds and literally just threw them out, tossed them out or poked them down in the ground or whatever. But some fell outside of the, of the, of the garden area. And he said the fowls of the air came and devoured them up. And then when he tells the meaning of it, he says Satan comes and devour, takes away the word that was sown in their, in their life. So this is people where you mention Bible verses to them and the devil takes them away quickly with whatever sin they're involved in. The second group is the stony ground. Now what can you plant on stony ground? Southern Missouri is not known for the wheat and corn and soybean capital of Missouri. Because Southern Missouri is the Ozarks and it's full of rocks. And if you've got a field in Southern Missouri, you can't plant much there, but you can raise cattle on it. But I went down when Brother Ron Dagonia had farmland down there, I saw big piles of rocks. And... He said, Hoggard, he said, you know the best way to get these rocks out of a field? And I said, no. And he bent down and picked one up and threw it in the back of his truck. <laughs> he said, like that. And I'm going, so basically you're saying you're never going <laughs> to get them out of there. But he had had somebody go through and picking up rocks out of this field. Nothing grows there. And when you sow, when you, when the word is sown on hard, stony ground, it may come up, but where is it rooted? It ain't. And it'll grow in springtime when you're getting a lot of rain. But in July, well, this year, June, July, August, I can go to my house right now and take you with me and show you exactly to the inch where my septic tank is because it's under that much dirt and there's a big brown rectangle in my yard because the grass won't grow when it don't rain it's just as brown as can be okay so that's what he means by that he said stony ground is people where they get a hardness in their heart and you preach something good and they like it but you preach something that they're guilty of and they're not about to change, then they jump. And I had a situation with a guy that he believed, I ought not tell this, I'll just say that he was involved in a sin that he refused to recognize as wrong. Refused. And I pleaded with him, I read him scriptures, I showed him, and he said before, he liked my preaching, he liked me, he liked this church, he liked everything, until I had to deal with a certain sin that he was involved in, that he got himself into, and believed in his heart that what he was doing was right. And the conversation went south he got very angry got up and walked out of my office and I ain't seen him since okay that's stony ground the uh, thorny ground where he says so not among thorns 
thorns, oh, you got good ground there. You got rich soil. You got water. I, like my flower bed, the, the dirt's all loose now. I can plant anything I want to in there. And it'll probably take off and grow. The roots won't have a problem getting through that hard, hard dirt. But those thorns are there. And I cannot get them out. They just keep growing out. And the best thing I know how to do is keep them pulled out. And don't let them just take over the whole thing. Or they will. So he said the, the thorns are the, the um, cares of this life. The deceitfulness of riches, well, that sounds like America, doesn't it? And the lust of other things. So basically naming sins. Sins are thorns. You sow the word of God into a person's life when all they care about is sinning. Then basically it'll grow for a while. But what will happen is their sin will eventually choke out the word that was sown in them and they'll bear no fruit no flower nothing so the good ground is those where the fallow ground has been broken up the thistles and the thorn little plants are taken out of the way and now this thing has a chance to grow people water it that's what preachers do. They sow the seed. They water the seed of the Word of God. I'm teaching you things and what the Bible means. But God always brings the increase. And it's up to God to do those things in our life. Amen? That was the bell. But let me finish this so we can move on next week. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah. That means get this flesh out of the way is what it's talking about. Lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Declare ye in Judah and publish in Jerusalem and say, look at this, blow ye the trumpet. What are we dealing with in Revelation? The trumpet soundings. Seven trumpets sounding. Blow ye the trumpet in the land. Cry, gather together and say, assemble yourselves and let us go into the defense cities. Set up the standard towards, in other words, Get in, get under God's protection. Get under God's protection. Set up the standard towards Zion. Zion is the kingdom of God, the house of God, the people of God. Where God is, retire, stay not. For I will bring evil from the north. And a great, what? Destruction. Any, you, any, study the word destruction, destroy, destroyer. They're all related. A great destruction. The lion. Oh, what did we just say? The lion. has come up from his thicket. And the destroyer of the Gentiles. Who's that? That's us. Is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make the land or make thy land desolate. And, and here's the thing. When you read Isaiah 13 and Isaiah 34. When God makes the land desolate, that's when the dragons show up. You read it. You read both those chapters and you will plainly see that when a land becomes desolate and the man, and the man in this case is Jesus Christ. What did Pilate say? Behold the man. What did Paul say? There's one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. When the man is there, the dragons won't be. When the land becomes desolate and man cannot be there and will not live there, the dragons will move in. I wonder how many churches are desolate. How many so-called Christian families, Christian homes are desolate now? He has gone forth from his place. To, the, his place is the pit. To make thy land desolate and thy city shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. And go match that up now. I, write this down. Isaiah 13, Isaiah 34. Because you're going to see those words in those chapters and the dragons showing up. The dragons show up. That means it's without inhabitant. It's desolate. It's a wilderness. It's like what you'd expect if you... We're walking through the woods and you came to this old field 
in the edge of this field, you find this old building, like an old house or whatever. You walk in that old house, what are you going to find in there? Raccoons, mice, bats, rats, spiders, roaches, all kinds of creepy things that don't normally live in a house because people live in a house. You take the people out of the house, boom. That's what you're going to find there, okay? So next week, we're moving on finally. Yes, ma'am. I believe that. Yep. What is going on? God give me the strength, and all of a sudden I know I pushed him up and he landed in the wall, and I heard a thump, and I was like, Thank you, Lord. So I believe you. I, it happened. And when you feel that kind of praise that God is with you to give you that kind of strength, nothing. You're not the first person to tell me a story almost identical to that. It's, it's it is real. And it is real. It, it, they are real. Yep. They are real. Okay? And they'll try it. This is what we wrestle against. That's why I started preaching this series again. This is what we're wrestling against. Okay? Father, we ask your blessings now upon your word. We thank you for it. Open up our eyes. Lord, please, God, break up our fallow ground. Get rid of the thorns, Lord, so that the Word of God can grow and do good things in our life. Make changes in us, God, that we need to change. We cannot change ourselves. Thank you, God, for this book. We pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.